today, Simon Levy. Um, he's an assistant professor at the Computer Science Department at the Washington and Lee University. Uh, he's an expert researcher in the area of distributed representations, and he's going to talk to us today about a new class of structured associative memory models called vector-symbolic architectures. Thank you. Um, let's see, can everybody hear me? If everybody can hear me, I won't use this. Uh, this thing. Okay. Um, so I just want to uh, put in a little plug for um, undergraduate teaching here, since I think uh, our erstwhile system is setting up my uh, the, the connection for my for my Mac laptop here. This is the connection coming down. So I teach at the Washington University, which is a small liberal arts college in southwestern Virginia, and um, I really want to encourage you guys um, to uh, you know stay in touch with undergraduate teaching. Um, I kind of feel like I'm punching above my weight last year. And, some of the amazing projects I'm seeing, but um, I'd like to put in a plug for um, you know trying to you know if you want to keep an eye on the future, I'd say you know working with undergraduates and getting these kinds of ideas into their into their heads before they get to the you know to the grad student the post doc stage would be a good approach. Okay. All right. So what I want to start with is kind of a big picture view of um, what I think has been our understanding of intelligence, at least in, in Western uh, thinking, Western philosophy. Going back to the time of, um, this is you know, David Hume and Rene Descartes, and this, there's this sort of fundamental division in the way that we think about intelligence that is first really, I think, the most clearly articulated in Western thought uh, by these two individuals um, who live roughly, I guess, within about 100 years of each other. You know, and and the, the basic distinction that I want you to think about is the distinction between intelligence as being just a lot of associations between things. So they draw analogies between things based on similarity versus the kind of computational intelligence that most of classical AI has been about, which is Cartesian reasoning involving things like Ben just talked about, like first order logics and second order functional uh, programming languages and variables and bindings and all those kinds of things. That this has been a remarkably persistent dichotomy in our understanding of intelligence um, in, in just about every kind of relevant domain. So if you look at um, even modern psychology, the psychology of language, Right, so this is a battle that took place in the late 50s between the, essentially the associationist psychologist, the behaviorist psychologist, B.F. Skinner, and the famous linguist Noam Chomsky. And, you know, we all know Skinner. Chomsky won the battle. He essentially derailed Skinner's career as a serious uh, cognitive scientist in 1959. Okay, so, so pretty much you know, the, the, the trend from then on, both in, both in cognitive psychology, linguistics, and in, um, in AI, has been uh, a sort of a constant struggle between people who think that you can build up associative models representing intelligence. So this is, I think this is Frank Rosenblatt, it's, a, it's the perceptron model that, of course, the fellow on the right, Marvin Minsky, um, you know, thoroughly trashed in 1969, and that, you know, essentially didn't revive until about another 15 or 16 years later. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I hope I've convinced you in these few slides that there's this kind of, you know, this, this kind of struggle in Western thought between associationist views you know, intelligence involves associating different things. You know, roughly if you want stimulus response, but all other kinds of associations, including internal associations, on the one hand, and then explicit symbolic computation on the other. So, you know, the idea that I want to articulate now is that, you know, part of what we need, I think, in AGI is a need for, we have a need for a set of new representational principles. And some of them that I've been familiar with in, in, in my excessively long graduate school career, and, you know, and, and talking to people in psychology and cognitive neuroscience, is, for example, ideas like Gibsonian affordances. In other words, the idea that you can't talk about intelligence as being something that's in your brain or in your head. The intelligence, the intelligence exists as, as, as a duality between you and your environment, okay? which is an idea that's sort of caught on AI. If you use the, uh, the Russell and Norvig AI book, they, they, they bring an idea up a lot, even though they don't call it an affordance. Obviously, you guys are familiar with distributed connectionist PDP representations. Um, I think, I don't know if Tony Plate is in the audience, so I'm going to talk about kind of represent, there is representation that he developed for holographic representations and with some inspiration going all the way back to Dennis Gobbler in the 40s and it was 1971 Nobel Prize in holography. And then some, some work that Whit Tabor at the University of Connecticut has done and I both also did in my, uh, in my PhD on uh, fractal representations of, um, of structured meaning. Right? So here's, a, here's just a brief uh, meaningless slide about how you can embed arbitrarily nested um, list S expression type structures in, in a fractal, in a nonlinear fractal. And if anyone wants to talk to me about that, I'd be happy to. I don't believe that's the way to go anymore, but that's what I did uh, six years ago. Um, so you guys, you guys know about the appeal of connectionism, right? So the idea was that 
connectionist models, models that are very grossly modeled uh, on, on actual neuron systems, can do a kind of cool trick where they appear to be doing rule-like behavior. So they appear to be doing things like just generalizing the past tense of English verbs by adding an ed at the end, as in these two examples. But they, they can also, in this Ronald Martin McClellan model, the famous model from 86, they can also learn somewhat idiosyncratic things like the internal change and in, in essentially the vowel quality in speak versus spoke. And they can all, go all the way towards, with the same finite architecture, they can also represent completely idiosyncratic associations like the, uh, the suppletive, as linguists say, the suppletive uh, past tense in English um, irregular verbs like go and went. Okay, but what we need is, I mean, you guys know this, what we need for real intelligence is something that can do not just association, but rules. So, for example, uh, it's a rule of English that if you want to say something like logically along the form of uh, ignores Mary John, meaning Mary ignores John, one way to say that would be Mary won't give John the time of day. So, I originally presented this slide at a grammar, a construction grammar conference, and construction grammarians are kind of proposing an alternative to Chomsky that even though they're not aware of it, has sort of a lot of the feel of modern connectionism, which is that they're interested in these irregular idiosyncratic kinds of constructions, but I could have just said that the, the sentence here is Mary ignores John, but you know, the, the point is that English and all other languages have these kinds of uh, idioms that you simply have to memorize, but they're rule-based themselves, right? So they have a little bit of the flavor of memorization, a little bit of the flavor of rules. Okay, so what's the problem with simple association, like a, a three-layer neuron? The problem is binding. Right, so let's say that I want to represent the, in, in, in a single neural network or a single set of, of activation vectors of a neural that I want to represent a concept like uh, red, square, and blue triangle. If I simply add up a bunch of representations for red and square and blue and triangle, I get just an undifferentiated mishmash vector at the bottom that could represent any one of those four concepts. Okay. So some people, a lot of people, and a lot of people still doing this, essentially talk about localist representations. I have a single neuron or pool of neurons representing square, a single neuron or pool of neurons representing triangle, you know, a single pool of neurons for blue, a single pool of neurons for red. And then if I simply activate or, or, or increase the weight between blue and square and between red and triangle, I like get blue square for a triangle. As Ray Jackendorf points out, however, I can also do red square and blue triangle you get something called the problem of two. What if I want to simultaneously represent blue square and red triangle, or if I want to simultaneously represent uh, red square and blue square, well, I get this, this pretty transparent problem of what the hell does this actually mean? If both red and blue are associated with square by you know, simultaneous firing or something like this, I can run into this kind of problem of two. More realistically, and this goes directly to what Ben just talked about, it's a great, a great opportunity to segue from his talk, how do you even consider something like variables in this association system? All right, so to finish up, I want to talk about this kind of architecture that began pretty much with um, Paul Smolensky's tensor binding model. And what Smolensky said was, here's a very simple model of, if I have a vector that represents one concept, the vector represents another, I can take their outer product, their, their, their cross product, right, their tensor product, and I can get something that represents the idea of binding the color red to the concept square. Same thing I can do with the triangle, right? Interestingly, you can bundle these different representations together, so you get this matrix, and I'm showing you five by five. What I'm actually working with in my own work is like 5,000 by 5,000 matrices, which I couldn't fit easily onto a, a page and have you see what's going on. Okay, so I can simply do matrix addition and get two different concepts, but including the bindings, unique bindings in one, and then Obviously, I want to be able to extract information from this reliably. I can essentially perform a matrix vector division and get out the original color part of the... Um, in other words, I can ask what's the color of the triangle given this matrix representing these two different concepts, and I get out blue. Um, there's even some wonderful connection to um, all this concept of recurrence that I think uh, Sweden was talking about, which is that you get this kind of messy, lossy compression for this thing because you're, you're adding a bunch of concepts together and you can use a, a, a somewhat neurally plausible net, like a heavy net, a hot field net, some kind of attractor net that converges to some representation that was stored in, in the process of doing this encoding. So there's lots of, there's lots of uh, plausible connections, however remote, to actual cognitive neuroscience. Okay, so obviously you guys are probably good computer scientists who picked up on the fact that um, this thing's going to grow exponentially. If I multiply 5 by 5 by 5 by 5 to keep binding things, the thing becomes exponential. And so a trick that Tony Plate came up with and up there in the 
top tier there, was simply to do uh, essentially a circular summation, a circular convolution along the diagonals. And so you can keep something of a constant size n, whatever n happens to be. So it doesn't, it doesn't explode exponentially. It also scales, of course you guys are AI people, so it scales very nicely. So roughly the number of concepts that you can store scales linearly with the size of the representation. Including, I mean, if you want to, you can go beyond what's plausible for human short-term memory with these things, right? So there's not really a scaling problem for these kinds of representations. You can compose them recursively, and we have time to go into that. And then finally, getting to Ben's issue, a wonderful thing about these representations is that there's essentially no distinction between constants and variables. Everything is some kind of entity or concept. If I can, you know, in other words, I can I can do binding on something called X, where X could be a percept from the environment. Right? It doesn't have any special status as a variable. It's just a vector that relates in some way to some kind of observable or concept in the system. Okay, so what is in current applications? Just to show you this isn't pie in the sky stuff. Um, the Chris Eliasmith and Paul Thagard have done some really interesting work on uh, a topic I think that's of interest to many people here on analogy. So they've shown some very psychologically, uh, two minutes ago, I'll do it, psychologically realistic results modeling what they call surface and deep structural properties of analogy. Surface structure means if we're talking about dogs and cats, I'm more likely to think of an analogy with dogs and cats than I have to think of with cars and with cars and trucks. And you know the the, the, the structural analogy is something like dogs chase cats, and you know maybe police police chase cars or something like that. That's the deeper analogy where, where I have to differentiate it into two different domains. Um, but relating to another talk that, uh, yesterday, in fact, or actually relating to something else Ben said about. Your wife being, you know, having this incredible ability at four levels of nesting of who's cheating on whom. This is this is this is actually something psychologically called the Wayson test, where in the 60s the psychologist Wayson showed that people can do remarkable amounts of computation on stuff that relates to real world experience, like like adultery or drinking or stuff like this. But they can't do anything, even the shallowest, simplest modus tollens kind of deduction on a task based on things like colors and prime numbers. Okay, there's some really good results on that. Um, there's some also interesting, very recent results by some psychologists on representing the kind of stuff that you can't represent with things like latent semantic analysis by using these kinds of vector representations. It's called the graphic representations. So they have a representation of a lexicon that encodes not just the meaning of words, but their relative order. What am I currently working on in my last two slides? Um, there's kind of an obvious sense of an homunculus here. You know, how, how do I decide what the vectors are? How do I decide how to construct things? What gets bound? So it has to be ground somewhere in perception. So this is some work that David Arathorn at um, Montana State has been doing. Actually, you can see it's sort of the Defense Department stuff. And he's been getting some money to do object recognition using a certain kind of very cortically, neurally plausible, heavily uh, feedback-oriented network that he calls a map-seeking circuit. Okay, so in other words, you basically have some, some stored representation in the upper left of a canonical image of a certain kind of tank and you've got an actual noisy scene, and through some iterations of this, of this network here, this feedback network, which doesn't have back prop or any kind of implausible stuff, it basically just uses heavy and running, right? You can filter out a representation of the actual tank that will best match your stored canonical representation. So what Ross Gaylor, my co-author on this paper, and I are interested in doing is, is sort of getting the homunculus out of this, this current model that we're, that we're using by grounding it in perceptual representation so that things like um, semantic relations, like next to, right, would come directly from recognizing images in the environment and, and, and combining them would be in this kind of vector-finding way. Okay, thank you for your attention.